water is something which we take for granted. This is a canal from the Colorado River in Arizona, United States. In this lecture, we're going to look at water ethics and water management. The report that we're using is one which I assembled a team uh, of multiple authors from around the world, in particular uh, from China, Mongolia, uh, from the United States, from Japan, from New Zealand. Many wars in the future will be fought over water. This is a site where we see the arid desert in the hot desert sun. So let me read some parts of this report and through this lecture we're going to look at different aspects of the use of water and how it's important. Even in the construction of this canal we can see shells. This is a little shell from a seashell living in the Colorado River. You can see them in the canal structures here. This report examines ethical issues associated with water resources utilization and management, including its uses in energy, agriculture and other domains. Water is the most essential substance upon which all life depends. Water is a non-renewable resource, though it can be recycled. Climate change, rapid industrialization and urbanization, continuing population growth and the management of water resources cause unprecedented water stresses. The access and use of water by humans and ecosystems is discussed in this report. Water is at the heart of many religions and culture. Cultural traditions, indigenous practices and societal values determine how people perceive and manage water and provide useful references for water ethics construction. And at the beginning, uh, uh, where I'm starting this lecture, I would like to say thank you to the ancestors and current residents of the Colorado Indian tribes. Uh, it's on their land, which I'm taking the uh, start of this video. We're going to see different parts of this report explored uh, in different uh, areas and people have lived over prehistory uh, relying on water. In this report we're going to also look at some possible ethical principles to resolve moral dilemmas involving water. Existing problems and current water management practices are discussed in light of these principles. The transformation of human water ethics has the potential to be far more effective cheaper and acceptable than some existing means of regulation. But the transformation of personal and societal ethics need time because the changes to ethical values are slow. Policy options are discussed with some examples that are further explored in the appendices which include four case studies conducted by members of a working group from perspectives of different fields and they illustrate both the theory and the practical application of ideas in the report more concretely. These include a case study on the need for a more efficient aquaculture industry, computer-aided community-based water planning in the Gila San Francisco decision support tool, the South to North Water Diversion Project in China, and a review of Chinese water ethics. The construction of water ethics needs joint efforts and interdisciplinary collaboration at all levels. By following certain general principles, adopting scientific methods and tools, arousing expert stakeholders and decision makers' responsibility to the, and conducting ethical education for young people, the construction of ethically acceptable water utilization and management systems can be expected to occur in the near future. The first chapter is called Water and Life. Water is an essential substance on which all life depends. Wherever is water, there is life. Where water is scarce, life has to struggle. 
about 75% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. As the saying goes, water, water everywhere. The distribution of water on the Earth, however, uh, is not all available. So we can see that fresh water is only 3% of all Earth's waters. However, the physical state of water, including the fresh water, is not always liquid. Nearly 69% is locked up in glaciers, ice caps and permanent snow cover of both poles, mountainous regions and in Greenland. Let's look at the table. You see the table looks at the distribution. So if only 3% of the water is fresh water, and this is an example in this canal, um, the 97% of the water is saline. We cannot use it easily. It costs energy for desalination plants. It may be possible in the future. 30% of fresh water also comes from groundwater. But the groundwater is being depleted, and we're going to look at that as well. Only 0.3% of fresh water on Earth is contained in river systems, lakes, and reservoirs. And this is the water which we're most familiar with. This water is so lovely, it's a hot day, we feel like jumping in. Uh, we cannot do them at the moment. So three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by water, but only some is uh, available for use. 99% of all water, oceans, ice, and most saline water and atmospheric water, is not available for our use. So, as we can see, only a small amount is available. Most is stored in groundwater, even of that which is available. So actually, uh, rivers and lakes constitute 0.0067% of the total water. So often we classify water into surface water and groundwater. Surface water is found in a river, lake, a canal, or surface embodiment. Surface water is exposed to many different contaminants. We expose it. Uh, we have exposure from animal waste, pesticides, insecticides, industrial waste, and many organic materials. Groundwater is also part of the precipitation that infiltrates down through the soil until it reaches rock material that is saturated with water. Water in the ground is stored in spaces between rock particles and slowly moves underground, generally at a downward angle, and may even seep into streams, lakes, and oceans. Groundwater is not always accessible, and sometimes it's difficult to locate or measure or describe it. Compared to surface water, groundwater is not as easily contaminated, but once it is contaminated, the full remediation and recovery is not easily achieved. Surface water and groundwater are often correlated and can be transformed to each other within the water cycle. It's also known as a hydrological cycle. A figure three in the book is a hydrological cycle. Surface and groundwater cycles are only part of the global cycle of water below the surface of the earth. Uh, we also have the evaporation uh, into the atmosphere and formation of clouds. So it's a cycle, there's no starting or ending point. The water can change states among liquid vapor and ice at various places in the cycle. Um, we're not going to see ice today, except in the freezer. Uh, but here you can see uh, there's water vapor, even though it's a dry climate uh, in the air. The relative humidity is quite small today. So water is not in a static condition, but in a dynamic exchange between the ocean, land and atmosphere. The turnover of water involves water evaporation and precipitation processes. The turnover of the Earth's water estimates is around 577,000 cubic kilometers per year. And about 70% of precipitation that falls on the land comes from ocean-derived evaporation and 60% from land surface. These large volumes of water illustrate the key role that precipitation plays in renewing water resources, especially recharging the groundwater, which is the main source of fresh water and 
and supporting both rain-fed agriculture and the ecosystem. But dynamics and value of a full renewal of water, full replenishment, depend on water volume and its dynamics. It's estimated that the full renewal time of the ocean is around two and a half thousand years. Groundwater, 1400 years. Ground ice, the permafrost zone, 10,000 years. Polar ice, 9,700 years. Mountain glaciers, 1600 years. Lakes, 17 years and eight days for atmospheric moisture. So the times vary, of course, with the climate. But that's uh, one of the important aspects of this dy dynamism of water. You can see this water is flowing in the canal. If we look at the water cycle, uh, the water cycle here is uh, showing um, precipitation uh, coming down into the oceans and reservoirs. This canal flows from the Colorado River, uh, which is uh, about a two kilometers up the uh, uh, canal and it gives um, uh, water to irrigate the fields. So this is desert turned into agriculture. You can see the difference between a field which has water and a regular vegetation. And as I said, this is uh, the power of water. So the Colorado River system is a very critical system and it being an example, since uh, we're recording this in the United States, uh, we're going to look at some aspects of this river. You can see here also uh, the river provides uh, a resource not only for human beings, but also for bird life. Various birds animals living in the water and we see even more. This is the Colorado River Agency, United States Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs. The federal government in the United States keeps a control on water and we're going to see through several reservations across the Indian system uh, in Arizona how Indian country has really had its water taken. This was dramatic for the colonization of peoples here uh, because their traditional methods of agriculture relied more on uh, a flood and uh, the floods bringing in silt and other mineral rich soils. Now we're going to see how they controlled the building of dams and across the Colorado system. But the Department of Indian Affairs is clearly an important agency in this uh, history. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, covers various aspects of the mandate. And we can see various buildings here in the town of Parker, Arizona, where they are looking at water and its management. Who pays for the water? This is a very interesting aspect people need to pay. Water used to come freely but now like everything it is uh, something which is commercially grown. But it actually comes from the sky doesn't it? Even the sky we may pay for. So this is the Colorado River. Colorado River flows from the state of Colorado in the Rocky Mountains through several American states out to the Gulf of Mexico. It's one of the most important rivers in the southwest of the United States, supplying water to many states, to the city of Los Angeles, Phoenix, and others. In the report, section 1.2, looks at the use of water, the consumption and utility. Although we use seawater and oceans in many ways, ranging from transport as a reservoir for dumping pollution to recreation, this report focuses on fresh water. Uses of water can be classified as either consumptive or non-consumptive. 
The use of water is consumptive if that water is not immediately available for another use. The source and location of a water are also measured in some schemes. Losses to subsurface seepage and evaporation are considered consumptive as the water is incorporated into a product. Water that can be treated and returned as surface water, such as sewage, is generally considered non-consumptive if that water can be put to additional use. A non-consumptive use is when water use does not diminish the source or empower the future water use. Utility is the most common concept. Let's discuss it more. And it would still be used if it comes back. Of course, some will evaporate. I want to have a look uh, from the north going to the south along the Colorado. We're going to change our view to illustrate some of the use. If you look in distance here, you can see uh, stacks of hay. They're made from the canals that we just saw, taking water from the Colorado River, using for agriculture, and then providing that hay, as we'll see at the very end of this video, to animals, our cows, that can grow beef and uh, be eaten. Now there are other uses of the feed stock is one of the biggest usage of water there is. You can also see uh, an environment of uh, grass, birds. Utility is the most common concept behind the different classifications of water use, though the actual meaning of utility and its scope have been changing over the last few decades. There is a growing recognition of indirect and non-use values when benefits arising from ecological systems or potential future use of water resources are considered. For example, wise use is a core concept of a Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, while the Convention on the Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International Watercourses in 1997 encourages equitable and rational use of water. Indirect or non-use values are also regarded as an optional value to preserve environmental resources, though there is substantial difference in interpretation focused either on risk reduction or utility maximization, provided that any action is irreversible and its result is uncertain. In the case of the International Water Course Convention, no use could be perceived as utility maximization since the only qualifying condition for no use is uncertainty and no consensus about the preferences between different uses of water. The use of water and water services are often referred to as interchangeable categories, which is another example of recognition of a multifunctional role of water. Based on this, the typology of water use is classified into provisioning services water for food production, plants and medicine, regulating services such as flood protection, erosion control, natural treatment of water quality, and cultural and social service such as cultural heritage, landscape and scientific research. The Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage in 1972 is an example for protection of the places based on their aesthetic, scientific or cultural values. The Yellowstone National Park in the United States, because of its outstanding scenic beauty, or the Ufagal Rice Terrace of the Philippines, for its communal system of rice cultivation, based on harvesting water from forest-clad mountaintops, are outstanding examples of a harmonious interaction of people and nature. Having identified the condition of water use and set, uh, set an international instruments, uh, this report has looked at legislation in various countries, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. But some of these principles and objectives are really uh, common all around the world. We have to look at this when we consider the use of a Colorado, which is involving several states in the United States and uh, United States, Mexico um, as nation states.
importantly, it also involves uh, various sovereign nations, Indian reservations, that had uh, been using this water and were dependent on the water for a long time. For example, the Colorado River um, uh, Indian reservations clearly the notes in the title that they were dependent on the Colorado River and they lived both sides of it which currently are divided by a state line between Arizona and California for example at this part of the river. Section 1.22 talks about agricultural water use. Agricultural use of water for irrigation, livestock, fisheries and aquaculture is estimated as the cause of 71% of total water withdrawal. The number is higher in low and middle income countries, so shown in figure 4. Between 15 to 35% of withdrawal of water for irrigation is unsustainable. The effective use of water is an ethical issue. It could reduce the water usage related to crop and animal production. Compared to the increase of cultivated land by about 24% from 1961 to 2003, the use of irrigated areas more than doubled from 1970 to 1995. About 70% of the world's irrigated land is in Asia, where it accounts for 35% of cultivated land. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea has the highest level with 73% of cultivated land under irrigation, followed by Japan 65% and China with 55%. Bangladesh, Nepal, Republic of Korea and Vietnam have more than 40% of cultivated land under irrigation. Some tropical countries of South Asia and the islands, Pacific Islands, have an average of between uh, 20 to 25 percent of the cultivated land under irrigation. Now these figures are from the, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization's Aquastat database. Cultivated crops, techniques and schemes of irrigation and sources of water vary between different parts of the world. In some countries uh, surface water such as lakes, rivers and uh, wells is a major source of irrigation whereas in other countries, groundwater is widely used. You can see this in Bangladesh and India and in other countries where it's withdrawn. So powered irrigation is common in dry season or in arid and semi-arid zones, but this requires uh, energy and the energy uh, is often based on pumping, which may be oil or some other mechanism. In Arizona, it's uh, oil, the energy for pumping some of the river into Arizona in the eastern part is by a coal plant uh, which pumps the water up and then sets it into a, a canal system which takes the water to other parts which normally wouldn't have it. This has allowed the irrigation of some other parts of Arizona. Otherwise, around the river, of course, so naturally there was uh, some water seeping out and some irrigation canals. According to FAO, the pressure on water resources is considered high if a withdrawal exceeds 25% of total renewable water resources. This threshold is already exceeded in India and the Republic of Korea with 34 and 26% respectively. Other countries like China, Japan, Democratic People's Republic of Korea and Sri Lanka also have high values of 19%, 21 18 and 20% respectively. In some areas of the world, irrigation is necessary to grow any crop. In other areas, it's focused on more profitable crops or it's used to enhance the crop yield. Various irrigation methods involve trade-offs between the crop yield, water consumption and the capital costs of equipment and structures. Irrigation methods such as uh, uh, most follow and overhead sprinkler irrigation are usually less expensive but also uh, less efficient because much of the water evaporates or runs off. 
The ethical issues and the choices depend on how to balance the benefit and risk and needs of today um, versus investment in the requirements for future generations. More efficient irrigation methods include drip or trickle irrigation, surge irrigation and some types of sprinkler systems where the sprinklers are operated near ground level. These types of systems, while being more expensive, can minimize our runoff and evaporation. Aquaculture is a small but growing agricultural use of water. Fresh water, commercial fisheries may be also considered to be an agricultural use of water that have generally been assigned to a lower priority than irrigation. As global production um, grows and demands for foods increase with a fixed water supply in the world, there are efforts underway to learn how to produce more food with less water. Okay. And you can see uh, a lot of this uh, developed around the Colorado Basin. So figure four in the book has competing water uses for the main income groups of countries comparing. So if we see uh, high income countries have a much higher proportion of industrial water use. And this is because industrial products, of course, are high value. 1.23 is industrial water use. It's estimated that 15% of worldwide water is for industrial purposes. A number of countries in Asia are developing their economies by this type of investment. 1.24 talks about household water use. The worldwide water use for household purposes is also around 15%. These include drinking water, bathing, cooking, sanitation, and household gardening. Basic household water requirements have been estimated by Peter Glick at around 50 liters per person per day, excluding water for gardens. Of these 50 liters, Glick estimated 2 liters for drinking, 20 liters for sanitation services, 15 liters for bathing, and 20 liters, sorry, 10 liters for cooking and kitchen. However, if we examine the water consumption of food and energy in most countries, these exceed the direct uh, consumption of water. And um, this is because the food production systems in many countries may be uh, using a lot more water. 1.25 talks of recreational water use. It's a small but growing percentage of total water use. The recreational water use is often tied to reservoirs. And in fact, up the river from where uh, this video is taken, uh, 20 miles is a park, a dam, and there's a lake above that for recreation as well as a water reservoir. And across the rivers, you'll see a recreation is a very popular pastime. Now, some of that is tied to hydroelectric functions, where they can get double multifunctional use. The release of water from a few reservoirs may also be in timed at times to enhance whitewater boating, which is also as a recreational usage. So the uh, dam operators can generate some uh, funds if they release their water at the time uh, when a rafters are using it and therefore the rafters have an enjoyable time with more water. 1.26 talks of environmental water use. Environmental water use is for the benefit of ecosystems or the environment rather than for human beings. Explicit environmental water use is a small but growing percentage of total um, water use including artificial wetlands, artificial lakes intended to create wildlife habitat. Fish ladders around the dams and water releases from reservoirs time to help fish spawn. Like recreational usage, such environmental usage is generally non-consumptive, but may reduce the availability of water for other uses at specific times and places. We can expect an increase in the use of, uh, for environment as the biocentric and ecocentric value systems are adopted more. So that the water is provided to nature, reservoirs, and national parks away from competing human needs. And in fact, uh, the uh, delta of the Colorado was provided some water two years ago to try to replenish some of the uh, 
dried out delta and biodiversity. It had been not had water for 20 or 30 years in some many parts. And so uh, the scientists then will investigate if there's an, what's the ecological impact. Section 1.3 talks about water for energy production. Water is used in a number of energy production systems, from mining of oil and for oil extraction, to its use as a coolant or driver of turbines. It's reported that hydropower shares 16% of the world's electricity production, and it remains the single largest means of renewable source of energy, representing 92% of total renewable energy generated in the year 2000. Okay. Now, this may be decreasing as we see uh, increasing use of solar and wind. The projection of price increases for primary energy sources. Carbon and counting incentives for clean energy technology are a good stimulus uh, for renewable energy sectors. Okay. And there's some studies represented and also a section on dams, but I will look at the dam section uh, when we visit the San Carlos uh, Reservoir and the Coolidge Dam. Skipping then to 1.4, water resources availability and stress. Okay. So, the permanent motion of water from liquid to solid gaseous states and its extensive and variable dynamics of turnover make water resource assessment a complicated, time-consuming and complex task in the meantime. Water resource assessment is not uh, limited to physical or quantitative measures, but it also considers as qualitative values. Clarifying these two definitions help us figure out how much water could be readily utilized by human feelings. According to UNESCO and uh, WMO, water resources is defined as water available or being made available for use in sufficient quantity and quality at a location over a period of time appropriate for an identifiable demand. So here do two definitions, water shortage and water resources amount should be differentiated. Not all water stored on earth can be called water resources. And only those available water resources and uh, quantity, um, sufficient quantity and quality as a resource can satisfy certain demands. So we can call that uh, water resources. The earliest comprehensive assessment of global water resources dates back to the 1970s. The first World Conference on Water Resources was in Argentina in 1978, also contributed to global initiatives and cooperation, urging the international community to strengthen its coordination on global water resource assessment. Since then, a number of initiatives have been taken to compile or compare existing data on water resources. Among them, the most recent and often referred to are FAO's Global Information System and Renewable Resources, and also the UNESCO IHP project on water assessment from 1991 to 1996. FAO's Aquastat is a database on water resources based on an accounting approach. The total renewable water resources of a country which consists of internal renewable re water resources plus external water resources. Okay. So the internal um, uh, water resources is the amount of water generated inside a country. Overall, freshwater resources are sufficient to satisfy human needs. However, due to uneven distribution across regions, countries and across countries, or even different sectors that use water, there are uh, often conflicts and competing interests over the freshwater. Different indicators are used uh, to uh, illustrate and estimate the distribution of freshwater resources. Okay. The European Environment Agency's definition of water stress is when the demand for water exceeds the available amount 
during a certain period of time or poor quality restricts its use. Water stress causes deterioration of freshwater resources in terms of quantity. Uh, this is, for example, aquifer overexploitation and dry rivers. And also in quality. Um, okay, so quality includes um, eutrophication, organic matter, pollution, saline, intrusion, and so on. The most widely used measure is the uh, Falcon Mark indicator or water stress index. They proposed 1,700 cubic meters of renewable water resources per capita per year as a threshold based on estimates of water requirements in the household, agriculture, and energy sectors and the need of the environment. Countries whose reasonable water supplies cannot sustain the figure are said to experience water stress. When the supply falls below 1,000 cubic meters, or a country experiences water scarcity and beyond 500 square meters, cubic meters, it's called absolute scarcity. So these are some indicators. So thank you for the river to provide this uh, water. In this area around the river, people have been sufficient water, but around in the overall state, is a water scarcity. There is a map in the book on figure five of the uh, per capita di distribution of water. Section 1.5 talks about water and conflict, and there's some discussion of linkages between the use of natural resources and conflicts involving multiple focus areas and themes. There's increasing work on water and conflict studies with strong emphasis on security and military threats. However, it's interesting to note that the environment was not considered an independent factor in the traditional agenda of conflict studies. So the databases on international conflict interactions and events, um, such as the International Crisis Behavior Project, Conflict and Peace Data Bank, and the Global Event Data System do not contain categories that can indicate a relationship between water pressure and conflict. This is despite considerable historical reflections on how water and land access claims have been a source of colonization and wars throughout the time. Although the security database of war and conflicts from the Pacific Institute is a more specific resource that considers the environment from a geopolitical context and provides categories of water resources with events such as violent disputes of the two Sumerian states of um, Lagesh and Umna, Umna on diverted water dating back to 2500 BC. The threat of a terrorist attack to the Wasak Dam, Pakistan's main water supply infrastructure, is considered in a similar vein. Well, in the first case, water is a causal cause factor of conflict in the latter. Water is merely a tool of a hostage situation and a milieu of an existing conflict. It's established that countries that cooperate in general over water um, will have better relations. Environmental security is critical for every society, and this notion has been expanding as well. We can see, um, if we refer to the several authoritative reports and studies, the concept of security is no longer the sole prerogative of interstate affairs, and besides its traditional areas of focus, such as the national security or integrity of political borders granted by military and diplomatic sources but it considers human and environmental dimensions as well. For example, a recent report from the UN Secretary General on Climate Change and its possible security implications, A slash 64 slash 302, from 11th November 2009, addresses this issue as a perspective of an independence problem and the relationship between, between human vulnerability, which includes food security and human health, and national security, statelessness, domestic and international conflict on natural resources, and an ability to use, um, sustain stably. 
But he's further indicating um, potential areas that could affect security. So we could say water security. Um, in a, one of the registries of transboundary river and lake basins by Oregon State Universities, uh, they have listed 263 international river basins covering 47% of the Earth's land surface. And a total of 145 nations include territory within international basins, river basins. 21 nations lie in their entirety in international water basins. And a total of 33 other countries have greater than 95% of their territory within these basins. So this water basin in Colorado is therefore very, uh, very good example of what we need. There is further discussion of transboundary pollution and water courses, uh, and people have made various efforts now to try and document that. Section 1.6 talks about water culture and religion. It's the last section of chapter 1. Um, let's talk about this briefly uh, before we leave for Colorado. So we can see um, uh, different uses of water represented. Now we can see, of course, traditional land here was used uh, by Native Americans for agriculture, also for ceremonies. Uh, for example, in Buddhism, water is used in Buddhist funerals. In Christianity, water is intrinsically linked to baptism, the public declaration of faith, a sign of welcome into the Christian faith. In Hinduism, water is imbued with powers of spiritual purification and cleansing of water is an everyday obligation. In Islam, water serves above and beyond for all, for purification, and it's needed to be clean to pray. In Judaism, Jews use water for ritual cleansing as well. Shinto is based on the veneration of the kami, and you almost must uh, begin a ritual with a purification of water. So the culture of water is under change. Let's look at some more examples of this. So chapter two of the report on water ethics what is water ethics? 2.1, the roles of water ethics. The topic of water ethics is being increasingly discussed in politics and practices of water resource management. This report uses the term management rather than access to cover all aspects of water use. Access to, utilization, allocation, quality, protection, etc. In this chapter, we explore different frameworks for water ethics referring also to the knowledge gained through several case studies that illustrate uses of ethical models and highlight ethical issues that are often ignored or undervalued in the management of water resources. And we suggest policy options that can be developed. The application of ethical concepts has a direct relevance in water resource management. It can support the decision-making process, which is very complex involving a range of scientific domains such as hydrology, groundwater, precipitation, runoff, water quality, and requires simultaneous considerations from different aspects of water use, both from the supply and demand side. How do we have an integrated approach to water management considering all the possible uses that we considered before? And we consider a multifunctional environment of the use of water. How do we integrate socio-economic aspects? Different tools and methodologies have been used to support this knowledge and methodology, and some of these are introduced as well. The role of ethics in amongst all this complexity is to provide operational assistance and conceptualization of different perspectives while helping us to keep a focus on whether the action, the consequences, or the motives uh, are best to consider. We can examine concepts of rights and duties or effects and outcomes. The precautionary principle and cost-benefit analysis uh, are also used at different times. Ethics can form both the source and the normative context of a particular decision by providing both reason and justification 
from this perspective, there are several viewpoints of ethics. Descriptive ethics is to describe the views that people have of a range of ideas. There is more research needed on the gap between stated attitudes to environmental issues and our behavior, however. Many people will say, we have different behavior, uh, yet what are the actions? So for example, let's take our friendly group of uh, ducks here. They rely on the use of the environment, their freedom to use, to walk. Uh, they're water animals, but they also enjoy the environment around them. And this is a, a riparian uh, sanctuary. So what are the ethics for these creatures? And what are our ethics as we try to preserve these concepts? 2.2 looks at frameworks for water ethics. So there are some uh, work in the work of the World Commission on Ethics of Science and uh, Technology who commenced. And in 2004, they had five case studies and they considered civil principles. On page 17 of this report, we look at this. Human dignity, for there is no life without water. And for to whom it the denied water, a denied life. Participation, for all individuals, especially the poor, must be involved in water planning and management of gender and poverty issues recognized in fostering this process. Solidarity for upstream and downstream interdependence within a watershed community poses challenges for water management, resulting in the need for integrated water management approaches. Human equality for all persons ought to be provided with basic necessities of life on an equitable basis. Common good for water is a common good, and without proper water management, human potential and dignity diminishes. Stewardship, for protection and careful use of water resources is needed for intergenerational and intragenerational equity, and it promotes the sustainable use of life-enabling ecosystems. Transparency and universal access to information, for if the data is not accessible in a form that can be understood, an opportunity will arise for an interested party to disadvantage others. Inclusiveness. Water management policies must address the interests of all who live in the water catchment area. Minority interests must be protected as well as those of the poor and other disadvantaged sectors. In the past few years, the concept of integrated water management has come to the fore and it means to ensure equitable, economically sound and environmentally sustainable management of water resources. Empowerment for the requirement to facilitate participation in planning and management means much more than just to allow an opportunity for consultation. People need to be empowered. This is one of the messages of bioethics. And best ethical practice will enable stakeholders to influence the management and policy decisions. There's been considerable reflection on environmental ethics throughout the world. The adoption of the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights by all member countries UNESCO in 2005 followed a series of consultation meetings. And in these meetings, a number of agencies and governments called for more formal commodifications and codifications of environmental ethics principles. Now, following that, there were attempts to develop uh, ethical principles for climate change and reports were made. But to find and develop a normative instrument, the climate was not right. The 2016 Paris Declaration on Climate Change gives us a hope that many countries in the world have decided to work together on a framework. So the efforts, again, for this uh, articulation of possible normative actions on environmental ethics are currently underway in 2017. And certain countries in the world who were opposed in 2007, 2008, are coming together now with uh, the chance that we may get agreement.
Now, some could say, well, they've had 10 years of development without having to comply with ethical principles, and that was one of the reasons why we couldn't get an agreement earlier. But uh, certainly, it's still some hope that we can get agreements. And in the 2005 declaration, at least countries agreed to safeguard and promote the interests of present and future generations, Article 2G, Article 2H, to underline the importance of biodiversity and its conservation as a common concern of humankind. 2.3 in this book looks at the principle of human dignity and the right to water. Um, and in Article 3 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, 1948, human dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms are to be fully respected. And Article 3 too, the interests and welfare of individuals should have priority over to the sole interests of science and society. In the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights, Article 14 on Social Responsibility and Health says 1. The promotion of health and social development for their people is a central purpose of governments that all sectors of society share. And 2. Taking into account that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition, progress in science and technology should advance in various things, but including the point, access to adequate nutrition and water. So the idea of a fundamental right to water, which had been discussed in the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization in the 1990s and 2000 onwards, saying there is a right to water, um, has been at least articulated in the 2005 declaration, including a right to food and water. Section uh, 2.4, the principle of equity in availability and applicability of water, the right to water. And Article 10 of the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights says, the fundamental equality of all human beings and dignity and rights to be, is to be respected. So they're treated just, justly and equitably. And there have been efforts for the equity of water rights to be promoted. Now water is one of the most essential resources for all human beings. Everyone has a right to water for various kinds of usage for living. Thus the human right to water is one part of a one item of general human rights. Accordingly, the water right is a fundamental human right that cannot be deprived of by anyone or any kind of power. But this principle is a postulation that evidently needs no argumentation here, and from which we start our ethical consideration of the water diversion and water usage. In the actual life, this equality of water right can be formulated as an equal quantity of humans' basic amount of water for living which can be calculated in a concrete number. The equality of water right means that everyone has a right to possess the same basic amount, with or without the added amount for comfort. Extravagant consumption of water is inconsistent with that principle. So clearly, in different countries in the world, we can see different amounts of water are used per capita. But people need a basic right. In the first chapter, we've looked at and discussed uh, just before how do we measure water stress? Is there a basic amount of limits? So is there 1,700 cubic meters per person per year? Is that an adequate amount? And are people that have uh, less than 900 extremely stressed? That was a calculation that was based uh, discussed before. Section 2.5 looks at ecosystem requirements for a healthy environment. We have seen we have a deep and eternal relationship with water. The first relationship we have is biological dependence and the fact that 95% of our body weight is actually water. People may also have social biological foundness for water as well as other parts of the environment. It is certainly an evolutionary advantage to like water an advantage to value nature. This is called a biophilia, and maybe we have a hydrophilia, a love of water as well. If we go looking in a desert, we see green, we are happy. 
because that is the source of the sustenance. In the Universal Declaration of Biophysics Human Rights, Article 17 is on protection of the environment, the biosphere and biodiversity. It states, due regard is to be given to the interconnection between human beings and other forms of life, to the importance of appropriate access and utilization of biological and genetic resources, to traditional knowledge, and to the role of human beings in the protection of the environment, the biosphere and biodiversity. So although many elements of a water ethic could be expressed as principles of water ethics, uh, this doesn't mean that principalism is the only framework to look at ethics. And we can look in another report on universalism and ethical values for the environment on the appropriateness of principalism. Uh, we need to consider our relationships to water. Can we balance the needs of water between human beings and nature? In an ecocentric view, a human being's need is not more important than and takes no priority over the needs of other creatures. And it subordinates to the whole system or nature. Therefore, at least a quantity of water usage in many industrialized countries should be reduced to around one-fourth of the total amount uh, that we use today. It is an echo mistake for us, as the offspring of the evolution of nature, to stand on the opposite of nature and to use it just for survival without any consideration of other creatures. In this case, emitting ecosystems right to water, leaving enough water for degrading our living level by reducing the amount of our usage, is a more appropriate option. Thus, the water that we can consider for human use would then be the remaining amount of water is taken away by the ecosystem. Such a new ownership of water could be a precondition for ethical principles concerning water diversion and water usage. So when we take water away from the ecosystem, as we saw in the canals from the Colorado in the uh, earlier uh, part of this lecture, we do need to consider the ecological environment. So the, the fact that there was no water reaching the delta of the Colorado for 40 years and loss of biodiversity in that area is a serious cause of demand uh, of uh, ethical decision making. We have a lot of concern. And the fact that we could then decide finally to reduce, release uh, some water to try and at least get the crops for a cycle, to get the seeds back, to see what could happen. And then to decide could, what could the balance between ecosystem services, ecosystem needs, and human need. Taking us away from the lakes and rivers is the ocean. All this water will end up in the oceans. The relationship of ocean science to medical bioethics is suggested by the concept of health of the oceans. This phrase was the title of a UNIP Regional Seas Report, produced by the uh, joint group of experts on the scientific aspects of marine pollution, GITSAP, in 1982. The idea of monitoring uh, the health of the oceans was found in several reports in the 1970s, and the concept is now well established. The normal and natural state of the ocean is difficult to define scientifically, as this will be changing over time. However, we can still see uh, impacts on the ocean's health and their natural state caused by anthropogenic factors, anthropogenic meaning human caused factors. What nations call healthy is also modified with changes in demands for particular resources and services, capital, knowledge, techniques, and political will. Uh, the GISAP group still continues to work as an international group monitoring the health of the oceans. And we have a lot of concerns uh, in that group, for example, about islands of rubbish, plastic rubbish in the oceans. And there are efforts now to try and reduce that, even in the middle of the Pacific or Atlantic Oceans, far away from land, you can find these islands of, of rubbish and plastic. 2.6 looks at the principle of vicinity. Now, the fresh water is clearly 
unequally distributed, both spatially and seasonally, challenging the physical access to reliable freshwater resources. In addition, there could be legal barriers to access when upstream land is privately owned or under the jurisdiction of another country. So the water resource might be appropriated by others and you can't have access. The principle of vicinity means that when there is a need for water, the first choice should be to use proximate water resources. This principle gives people who live closer to water the precedence in using it, uh, rather than those who live far away. But it should be pointed out that this precedence is not a privilege. Uh, instead, it's merely due to their favorable situation. Those who are closer to the water and have a convenience of using it also have a special duty to care for the water and use it in a manner that will not affect the legitimate interests of downstream users, other users. These include prevention from contamination and no destruction of the natural flow. There are also special duties for those who use water upstream from others, both for surface and groundwater resources, including the obligation not to cause significant harm. It's much more responsibility than the right, that is to say. If one person lives closer to the water and has more convenience using it than others who live further away, he also has a greater duty to prevent it from pollution and destruction. And this is not only in the river, there's also groundwater. You know, groundwater goes downstream as well, and is very important. 2.7 is the principle of frugality. Okay. So the principle of frugality means that people in the vicinity of water uh, should not use water exceeding their actual needs. People should only use the amount for basic uh, living needs, for comfort and for maintaining in the local ecosystem. So that water that is not used can be used for the communities and other places lacking water and kept for future generations. If we keep on depleting our groundwater going deeper and deeper, it's uh, becoming unreachable for our future generations. To balance water utilization, the government may develop a policy to adjust the levels between the places with the water surplus and those with deficiency, so canal systems and pipes, and limits on use, uh, some of these examples. Prince, section 2.8, the principle of transaction. This means that saved and surplus water from the allocated amount can be traded as a commodity in the water market, either through water banks, water exchanges or transfers, whereas users have a private right to the use and ownership of water resources. In the vast majority of Asia-Pacific countries, for example, water resources are regarded as public property, and except for household purposes, appropriation and use of water is often achieved through the temporary granting of a permit granted by a state. Often beneficial or multi-purpose uses of a key enabling condition which may alter the rights holders. Nevertheless, there are practices when spring and mineral water are excluded from models from basic amounts for living and may be sold for commercial use and you have the development of uh, spring water companies. In Arizona, you can also see uh, finally the water rights in the United States were discussed in the 1970s in a treaty to try and bring back the rights of uh, Native Americans to water, the roots of their water and their rivers had even been diverted uh, by dams, as we will see, uh, and they didn't have access to water. So, as a compensation, uh, they guaranteed a relatively low price and sufficient water even though the state itself has not necessarily a uh, large amount of water. But this is a part of a compensation because initially they were the users of the water. So legal rights to water for indigenous peoples is something which uh, needs to be carefully guarded. Now there are other issues such as uh, use of water by the mining industry which is depleting many of these uh, concerns. Uh, many of the water. 2.9 is the principle of multiple and beneficial use of water. So let us look again at some of the uses of the water. Uh, these are some uses of the water. Uh, they're using it in a sustainable manner, not depleting, 
and uh, we can see categories of water in uh, table one. Uh, echo usage is an example for human usage but also for the environment. Okay. So here we have uh, also the development of uh, sanctuaries for species. Now these species, some of them may be uh, natural, and some of them may be introduced. Another use is local usage for living, agriculture, industry, commercial, recreation. Ex three, external usage and water diversion for living, agriculture, industry, commercial. Four others, for example, uh, it could be emergency use of water. Now, you can see the line where the water has come. The water is there, it's not here. Without water, this land is very dry, as you can see by the types of uh, plants that are growing here. But this is uh, a sanctuary. So the principle of multiple use is uh, very important. So that's uh, 2.9. 2.10, the principle of mandatory application of quantity and quality measures. Uh, we need to ensure the quality. The quality of water is used for different things. Drinking will be different. Uh, you can see here the aeration system in this uh, pond to try and keep uh, air coming in to keep it fresh uh, because they're also uh, stocking with uh, fish such as rainbow trout. People get a fishing license, they can fish in this pond uh, and get uh, recreational use. Other fish, of course, for the parts of the ecosystem. 2.11, the principle of compensation and user pays. So people may pay for the use. Somebody has to pay for the water. Principle of polluter pays, 2.12. 2.13, the principle of participation. 2.14, the principle of equitable and reasonable utilization. So we're going to discuss some more examples of these principles uh, as we go to different locations. So what happens when we take the water away? Well, this is the Salt River. Uh, the Salt River in Arizona. Be able to see some salt, uh, you cannot see the river. About a hundred years ago, the United States government built the Roosevelt Dam, at that time, the world's highest concrete block dam. And it diverted the water away from uh, certain traditional paths of water. And the Salt River was uh, a river which flowed through Phoenix Valley. It had uh, seasonal flows, meaning when the snow melted in the spring, there were sometimes uh, seasonal floods. Uh, it led to a very rich alluvial soil, uh, good for growing certain types of crops. The European settlers, however, were not used to this type of agriculture and at the time uh, they uh, really uh, found the floods frustrating and at the beginning of 20th century was a time we were really a peak of this concept of the control of nature. We can control nature, we can build dams, concrete dams, we can show the power of human engineering and make everything a bit more predictable. So that may have worked for some time. Now what's also serious is that uh, around 1854 the Salt River Indian Reservation had been confined to the land including this river. So the river was still a great source of their water. What happened when it's dammed in the early 20th century is uh, uh, water is controlled. 
Now you will find pockets of water occasionally in the bed of a salt river, but uh, it's largely uh, desolate. And you can see uh, underneath there must be some water, there is some greenness here. And uh, right now a lot of the historical gravel and shingle and stones are harvested in the sand and gravel company for making concrete, for constructing concrete cities, freeways, buildings, we need concrete, so they can get money in this way. It's also the holes they dig uh, can then be filled for landfill, for rubbish. So this is the sort of a modern life that we live, uh, quite different. Now, more and more rivers around the world gradually are becoming dry, dry riverbeds. Now, that is, uh, has a lot of consequences. It has consequences because uh, how do we grow our food? We need water. So this is a uh, basalt river bed. We're going to look at some particular aspects of this. Uh, you can see uh, alluvial stones. You can see the great force that used to be here from the size of these round stones. Okay, so the floods would bring down the stones. You would see all sorts of stones and uh, some really pretty stones. You will see up here uh, layers of riverbed. Uh, it's hard to believe it used to flood even over the edges of this river uh, coming from the mountains. So that is uh, development. Now we can see some sorts of life living here. There are seasonal rains in the spring and uh, once it gets very hot in uh, late July or August there will be monsoonal rains from thunderstorms up to about 50 degrees Celsius and then there will be thunder and rain in many days. So you can see here, you can see development, you can hear the roads uh, built and the mountains from which the water used to flow. At the edge of a riverbed you can see how the soil has started to grow here. So this is how uh, we get land and this uh, soil is extremely rich and fertile. Uh, you can grow many crops if you provide the water to it and uh, the dry grass from the spring is here, you can see. So this alluvial riverbed uh, are a feature of many uh, countries. It's a common feature of a uh, development of land and over the years that's why people relied on this alluvial soil uh, bringing the nutrients down a great source of uh, new soil. This is a view from the top of the river and you can see an interesting feature. Uh, a concrete water drain. Now this stops some of the aspects of the uh, erosion from the road. But it's a, and So in a sense it does stop erosion, it protects these stones and the structures of the bridge. Uh, many rivers, we'll see however in many countries, the river banks have been changed to concrete. Uh, this of course makes it very difficult for certain types of plants to live. At least the Salt River still has the natural uh, banks in this part of a river. Some parts will see it converted to a concrete banked river. Um, so the ecocentric approach to use of water relies on providing an ecosystem uh, that people, people, plants, animals and different creatures can inhabit and share together. Well this is a contrast. This is the San Carlos Reservoir, the dam. It's a part of the Gila River San Francisco water system. It's on the uh, tribal nation of the San Carlos Apache. 
Indian Reservation. And we're going to go over here soon to look at the headwaters of the dam. I should not say the headwaters, the headwaters of what flows. A very regulated system. Built at the time, almost uh, 90 years ago, the Coolidge Dam, still for the last 90 years under federal control, even though this is a tribal reservation. Now, the history of this lake, underneath the lake, there were not many people uh, living here, though there were some tribal properties and of course the San Carlos Lake River. What was very symbolic, around 1870, old San Carlos internment camp. And so uh, thousands of people died in this camp. The internment camp was flooded with the lake. So that unfortunate and sad memory of colonization uh, is lost with the lake. You can still see foundations if you look uh, further up there. Uh, further up the lake there is also a memorial, the old San Carlos Memorial, to the people who passed away. Uh, we could say a lot more, but uh, it's a very serious attempt at colonization. This is looking eastwards. To the west uh, mountains and further on this mountain range are many traditional lands. Now some uh, are still used for harvesting of medicinal plants, but not too many. Uh, the reservation uh, was kept strictly. Those who left the reservation were killed. The water at times has been lower and higher. It's at a medium level today. The green algal blooms, you can see, uh, not too much water flowing through this lake. So fishing and recreation. Um, so let's come back to the uh, report and we'll see the section on page 8. Uh, from the World Commission on Dams. So we're going to see this lake is actually formed by, at the time, the world's largest concrete dam. You'll find it's a rather strange why in the middle of nowhere on the San Carlos Apache Reservation. Various reasons in the control of water. Uh, and this was not really for hydroelectricity. This was for irrigation and flood control of this lake. There is a small hydroelectric plant as we're going to see. Being amongst the biggest human-made single structures, and besides the economic importance, hydroelectricity generation and dam building business have generated significant debate over the land use and modification of the natural environment. Traditionally, the engineering ethics and dam construction only focused on technical feasibility and financial accountability. The moral or ethical obligation of individual professionals and corporations towards society and the environment was neglected. Moreover, the scope of the debate was not simply the divide into the pro-environmental groups against the hydro industry business uh, because of the negative environmental impacts of large dams to local communities. The controversial over the Distribution of burdens and benefits, concerns about accountability and participation of affected communities, n neglected analysis of social costs including involuntary resettlement, and doubts in long-term benefits have grown unparalleled and embodied in several statements that called for a moratorium uh, or prohibition on large dam construction. The World Commission on Dams was established in 1998 to provide guidance and it declared that there were five core values, equity, sustainability, efficiency, participatory decision-making, and accountability. The report also outlined seven strategic principles, which may be appropriate to many energy production systems. These are one, gaining public acceptance, 
Two, comprehensive opinions assessment. Three, addressing existing dams. Four, sustaining rivers and livelihoods. Five, recognizing entitlements and sharing benefits. Six, ensuring competence and compliance. Seven, sharing rivers for peace, development and security. Following the World Commission on Dams, a number of organizations have become involved in discussions, including the World Wildlife Fund, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, World Bank, Asia Development Bank, Africa Development Bank, World Health Organization and the World Water Council. The United Nations Environment Programme accepted to accommodate multiple stakeholders in follow-up action and to support dialogue on dam construction engaging stakeholders through its dams and development program. The HSBC group also adopted the Ecuador Equator Principles in 2003 and according to its policy will offer no financial services to energy sectors to support operations in UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the Ramsar list of wetlands of international importance, and in tropical and high value conservation forests. A common recognition for basic principles, guidelines and recommendations has been reached on paper, but there is universal social, no universal social consensus, and still there are numerous controversies, especially over large hydropower schemes or large irrigation schemes. A significant amount of arguments from different aspects, research materials, case studies and critical thoughts have been documented. Statistics from the International Commission on Large Dams show a significant decline in hydropower construction since the late 1980s. Multinational financial corporations have serious routine proceedings to answer to question whether or not to build dams. Now, is this a large dam? We're going to see the dam, but at the time it was the largest dam. Is this a tropical forest? Is this a biodiversity preserve? Not really, but in the desert there are uh, I know there are particular resources and uh, plants that grew based on this uh, cycle of flood uh, in the wet seasons and rainy seasons. So a different type of ecosystem evolves and you can see in some of the plants that surround us these types of uh, uh, plants and how they have adapted to the environment. So we're going to uh, look here at the San Carlos Apache Reservoir. And let me go back to this report on page 8, section 1.3. So I want to talk about dams. The significance of the Coolidge Dam is that at the time it was the world's largest concrete dam. Uh, we will see the dam soon, but let's look at the reservoir and consider this uh, uh, discussion. Being amongst the biggest human-made single structures and besides the economic importance, hydroelectricity generation and dam building businesses have generated significant debate over the land use and modification of a natural environment. Traditionally, the engineering ethics in dam construction only focused on the technical feasibility and financial accountability. Uh, there were considerations, for example, of uh, fault lines or earthquake zones uh, on the safety. The moral or ethical obligation of individual professionals and corporations towards society or the environment was often neglected. Moreover, the scope of debate was not simply the divide into pro-environmental groups against the hydro industry business because of negative impacts of large dams to local communities. The controversy was over the distribution of burdens and benefits, concerns about accountability and participation of affected communities, neglected analysis of social costs including involuntary settlement, resettlement and doubts in long-term benefits have grown in parallel and been embodied in several statements that called for a moratorium or a prohibition on building further large dams. The World Commission on Dams was established in 1998 to provide guidance and it declared that there are five core values equity, sustainability, efficiency, participatory decision-making and accountability. The report also outlined 
seven strategic principles which may be appropriate to many energy production systems. These are 1. Gaining public acceptance. 2. Comprehensive options assessment. 3. Addressing large dams and existing dams. 4. Sustaining rivers and livelihoods. 5. Recognizing entitlements and sharing benefits. 6. Ensuring compliance with standards. And 7. Sharing rivers for peace development and security. Following the World Commission on Dams, a number of organizations have become involved in discussions, including the World Wildlife Fund, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, the World Health Organization, the World Water Council, many NGOs, also uh, sometimes local, community and state governments. The United Nations Environment Programme accepted to accommodate multiple stakeholders in follow-up action and to support dialogue on dam construction and engaging stakeholders through its dams and development project. HSBC Group also adopted the Equator Principles in 2003 and according to its policy will offer no financial services to energy sectors to support operations in UNESCO World Heritage Sites, Ramsar List of Wetlands of International Importance and in Tropical and High Value Conservation Forests. A common recognition of basic principles, guidelines and recommendations has been reached on paper that there is no universal social consensus and still there are numerous controversies, especially over large hydropower schemes. A significant amount of arguments from different aspects, research materials, case studies and critical thoughts has been documented. Statistics from the International Commission on Large Dams show a significant decline in hydropower construction since the late 1980s. Multinational financial corporations also have serious routine proceedings to answer the question whether or not to build dams. Now, in this dam, built with the federal government in the United States at the turn of the 20th century, when there was this concept of control of nature, uh, federal governments tended to implement projects with not too much consultation. The fact that it was on tribal community land uh, may have been significant. Uh, what benefits were there for the tribe? Really not much. Uh, perhaps a recreation. The loss of the internment camp was a benefit in a sense, but in a sense they moved to a new San Carlos. They moved people away from this internment camp, trying to hide this uh, traumatic memory. Ninety years on, the water is still under federal control, even though the land is officially uh, a sovereign nation. Officially a sovereign nation, but the water resources, how much water is let out and obtained, is controlled by the federal government as part of a water conservation scheme. Now, we're going to learn more about that scheme in the following section. The ecosystem here is uh, not a tropical rainforest, obviously, okay? but it is still uh, important to preserve. Now, there are sufficient resources we can see uh, for various types of crops and uh, medicinal herbs and just nature on its own. In the season, we can see uh, certain flowers. Uh, cactus has flowers. Uh, some of the others have their traditional flowers on them. And many of these crops are important resources, uh, both the flower, for example, and uh, also the roots of these uh, plants. So the yucca and uh, other adobe and other uh, plants are an important feature. Eagles inhabit this, uh, this area. Uh, there's usually a pair of nesting eagles uh, looking out over the lake. Uh, which I've been blessed to see at different occasions. So in the middle of the desert, this takes us back to what looks like a building from Chicago. This is the Coolidge Dam, the back. You can see the canyon, obviously a good formation for building a dam. 
this is the reservoir behind it. Let's explore what made people build a dam in this location and why did they build this? It was opened and uh, President Coolidge came here, United States President. It's in the middle of nowhere. Hey, of course, if you uh, respectfully the ancestor of a land, it's the middle of a very important part of the world. Can you imagine the size of this concrete spillway? Expecting sometimes that the reservoir would be so tall uh, it would threaten and then the concrete spillway. Out flows the water and the water feeds what is a uh, Gila River uh, water system. So you can see uh, how this can regulate the water. The water is regulated and fed downstream. Now of course it means uh, on the positive side there'll be water uh, through the dry season in the summer to feed the agricultural systems and irrigation. That certainly suits the modern agricultural systems that we have. However, uh, it does not suit, of course, all the systems that were existing. Now, whether the new system is better than the old system, it's a matter of uh, discussions of civilization. Certainly, uh, food security may be better, though one can really question that, because the health of Native Americans has an uh, average life expectancy around 49 years, 30 years less than the general population. Reliance on foods which are not healthy anymore. The loss of agriculture had dramatic impacts on the quality of life and health of the communities here. So we can really question some of the claims that have been made about the benefits of the system. This is a view from the other side of the dam. You can see another spillway here. Now it's been a few years before the water, since the water was up to this time and I think the gates uh, for this don't seem to be even in place. I don't think they actually need any gates on the spillway. If the water gets so full, they're going to let the water go. See the algal blooms, consequences of agricultural fertilizer runoff. And there's a lake. If you can listen to a little sound, it actually is rain. Rain. So the Coolidge Dam, I will start again, built by the United States of America, Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Irrigation Service. Calvert Coolidge, President of the United States of America. Uh, other dear members of the uh, Chief Engineers, Secretary of Interior, personnel, contractors. The date of work commenced January 1927. The first concrete placed November 24th, 1927. Dam construction completed October 25th, 1928. Okay, so it took 12, 11 months exactly. Elevation of the base of the dam, 2,286 feet. Elevation of the roadway, 2,536 feet. Height above the bedrock, 250 feet. Reservoir ca capacity, 1,200,000 acre feet. Foundation rock and spillway evacuation, 317,000 cubic yards. Total concrete placed in the structure, 204,000 cubic yards. It required 3,500 tons of reinforcing steel. The length of the central buttresses at the base are 270 feet. Maximum span of the dome is 180 feet. Total overall length of the structure is 920 feet. Dedicated by the President himself in March the 4th, 1930. Let's have a little walk on the dam. So, on page 51 in the report, we see case study 2. And this is a map. We are at uh, this place here up in this corner of the water management system. Now the water is flowing into this, from this basin into the Gila River here. And the Gila River is what we see on the other side of the dam. So... Now this 
have. Uh, I'm not going to turn the dam off. Uh, I don't. Uh, I think this app operates a little bit. Uh, it still turns, but there's no doors, so you can't open the spillway. But in the best case scenario, where there is so much water in this reservoir, uh, the spillway could be used to put the water downstream. So case study two. There's a long history of struggle of access to water in the arid southwest of the United States. And water allocation conflicts in the southwestern region of New Mexico and uh, Arizona are no exception. The legislation surrounding the water management of the Gila River, pronounced Gila, Gila River, lasted 50 years. The Gila River and its tributary, the San Francisco River, begin in New Mexico to pass through the state of Arizona before merging into the Colorado River. The Gila San Francisco Basin covers 9,000 square miles of southwestern New Mexico. Feeds into, of course, this part in Arizona as well. And here it comes. Everything comes here to San Carlos Lake. Um, the wilderness area uh, was actually the first designated wilderness area in the United States. The western endangered species include the southwestern willow flycatcher, loach minnow, spike dace. The agricultural communities that utilize the surface water for irrigation among the Hiller riparian region uh, date back uh, millennia. This report says date back to 1800 before the New Mexico statehood. But actually, of course, Native Americans were here. And uh, when this report was published, the author was not aware, I think, of the ancestral canaling as part of a revision of history that we need to do when we look at uh, these uh, parts of the uh, United States and other countries as well. So, on page 53, the section is on community-driven modeling. So, the modern attempts to develop a computer-based model are described. A community team meetings were held with web, web conferencing and community meetings to try and develop decision tools on how to conserve water. And there is a home page, and you can see the hydrograph on figure 11 on page 54. But certain years there are large amounts of diversion, and other years there are nothing. Now, these cycles of drought uh, over multiple years. So we see water in 1979, 1983, 1991, 1995, 1998 peaks. So this is, a, is over time. So not every year do we, is there water. But in certain years when there is water, more water can be shared for agriculture. The conclusion of the study was that collaborative consensus-driven community modeling processes enabled the ethical quality while balancing human interests, ecological demand and natural resources. The use of a computer-aided tool, like this uh, Hitler San Francisco Decision Support Tool, provides a platform for productive and engaging dialogues. Uh, and this paper is written by Amy Sun of Sandia National Laboratories in the United States. Uh, she came to our meetings on water ethics in uh, Beijing University, Beijing University and we discussed uh, this model. Uh, the idea is that these types of community engagement projects could be useful models. So I have the question is really, how do we get these support tools? And the support is offered, the, the tool for decision making, of course, feeds into existing structures. So the San Carlos Lake uh, may not have had community consultation when it was made in 1929 and opened in 1930. Uh, you can find even old video archive footage of President Coolidge at the opening of the dam. Uh, and please look at the way that different ethnic groups were seated and uh, used in this performance. I use the word performance. Uh, of course, for management of flooding, this was a godsend. Why do I say godsend? Well, the water now is flowing out nicely. You can regulate its distribution. 
and perhaps be ethical to divide it among different users. Now, that's good if the system is followed ethically and equity is used. Remember, we talked about ethical principles uh, such as equity, consultation, participation, and so on. I'd like here, some of the architecture of a dam is uh, rather interesting. A very uh, small amount of uh, electricity is you know, produced, but actually if you have turbines working here, they can produce electricity. You can get something from this, and why not? Geological formations are interesting. Just imagine this amount of water, the river, how it was flowing through the different seasons. The types of life that it supported was somewhat different to the regulated system, but it created. So that's an example of water ethics in practice. And so at the time, in 1930, this was the largest concrete dam in the world. Now large dams, uh, nowadays we think of something bigger. The Three Gorges Dam in China displaced over one million people. Uh, different scale. Uh, so we saw the evolution of dam building, but this was a very important uh, project and step along the way. Uh, so now I'd like to discuss chapter three. Uh, we're in this report on water ethics. And we come here to the campus of the uh, American University of Sovereign Nations. The problems in the current water management, the need for water ethics. So we've seen dams, we've seen rivers. We now see, uh, in fact, in this uh, relatively uh, green part in a valley between arid hills, we see a juniper tree. Juniper is a very beautiful. Uh, this is actually uh, alligator bark juniper and oak trees and uh, there are deer, and elk and uh, other animals living in this environment. So the trees here came, they grew naturally. This is an example that even in a very arid climate there are solutions for water management. So chapter 3 on page 24 looks at current uh, water management. 3.1. In the book The Blue Planet Run by Rick Sholan and Jennifer Ewett in 2006, the following facts and numbers have been listed. Um, 1.1 billion people worldwide, so one in every six people, do not have access to clean water. 1.8 million children die every year from waterborne diseases, one every 15 seconds. 40 billion hours have been spent each year in Africa due to the need to collect and haul water. 5.3 billion, two-thirds of the world population, will suffer from water shortages in 2025. So this is a, a, a challenge in every continent. This report looks at, particularly at Asia-Pacific, uh, but even in Asia-Pacific where we see it's going to be a green place, uh, there's uh, seasonal monsoons, tropical forest, lush rice fields, but many areas uh, have water shortages. In Africa we see massive water shortages. So even in Asia, 100 million people in Southeast Asia and the Pacific lack access to safe water. 200 million people without access to safe sanitation. 80,000 children in Asia die from diarrhea each year because of uh, dirty water. The reasons behind the water crisis are global. These include climate change, rapid industrialization and urbanization, continuing population growth, and mismanagement of water resources. 
this unprecedented use of water is really a mismanagement. So much is wasted. We can just uh, educate people in sustainability and in management, and then we would solve some of these problems. At every stage in the water cycle and the use of water by people, we can see uh, challenges. There's a list at the bottom of page 24. One, physical problems. Physical problems such as poorly developed water supply and wastewater treatment facilities and incomplete water metering or monitoring systems. Two, uh, water pricing problems. Low water prices are one of the leading factors contributing to excessive water use in agriculture. The method of determining a water price should be sufficient to meet operational and man maintenance costs. Uh, if we take China as an example, water pricing is generally based on irrigated land area or only based on electricity used. The water prices applied for industrial and domestic uses do not reflect the actual cost of the water either. And third, organizational problems. Most of the water conflicts in the world are caused by organizational problems. Integrated water resources management has not been fully implemented in most of Asia and the Pacific. In the case study uh, two, a brief introduction to the trans-jurisdictional water quality issues in China. The overlapped and distributed institutional organizations will also be introduced. So, management of water is clearly important. Uh, in this case, for example, and this is an area called the top of the world in Arizona, some of the water has been contaminated because of copper mining. Now we cannot see exactly from this angle uh, the copper mining, but if we uh, uh, move around uh, in this direction, uh, behind the machines, behind those hills there are uh, barren, uh, destroyed hills. They are destroyed by copper mining. Okay, and downstream of this uh, reservoir they're also proposing to take uh, more water. So you can see uh, this type of uh, environment has a number of um, uh, opportunities for really a ecological development human development. Imagine sitting in the sun or sitting under the trees. There's a great microclimate developed here uh, by this environment and that's some of the things that will be lost if you uh, destroy this type of environment. Now another serious issue that leads us to section 3.2 is uh, pollution. In this case, in this area, uh, although I drink the water from the artesian well, uh, there is uh, copper mining upstream in the water aquifer and the gold mining. And so probably it's safe, but well, who knows? Uh, it's been measured to be safe, but mining is a polluting activity. Uh, we saw just before in the pictures from San Carlos Lake the algae blooms in the lake from the fertilizer runoff. Um, so this is another type of pollution. Human activity is of course the main cause of ecosystem changes in the world. We can see the effects of human activity everywhere in the world. From the atmosphere to the oceans, from the poles to the tropics, from the depth of the oceans to the highest mountains. The concept of stewardship is required to maintain a sustainable way of life and a healthy world. Environmental problems may be able to be traced back to the beginning of civilization, but are getting worse with the global scale of air and water pollution. 
the introduction of new chemicals and the still growing human population. Much damage is unintended and unforeseen, such as the acidification of lakes in Scandinavia and Canada from acid rain from the burning of carbon fuels. Restrictions on the release of sulfur and nitrous oxides have reduced the level of these acid residues uh, in the last couple of decades, showing that pollution can be controlled. While our sulfur dioxide emissions have fallen, the acidity of rain has actually remained high in some polluted areas due to a parallel reduction in basic cations continued, uh, contributed by particulate matter in the atmosphere but neutralized as of rain. So you can see the complexity even of uh, the chemistry in the atmosphere. But we uh, simply should not uh, contribute to the atmospheric pollution. And so countries such as China, with uh, the pollution has been noticed substantially, uh, have started now to take efforts uh, to mimic those that were done in the North America and Western Europe um, a few decades before. There still needs to be further reduction in pollution if acid rain is to be avoided. Uh, now we can expect this issue to continue if we use more coal-based energy plants. So it's not just the release of carbon dioxide for global warming, it's actually also the release of sulfurs and nitrous oxides and acid rain. Pollution could be defined in many ways. One definition is that pollution is the appearance of some environmental quality for which the exposed community has inadequate information and is thus incapable of an appropriate response. Pollution can also be defined as introduction by humans, directly or indirectly, of substances or energy into the environment, resulting in deleterious uh, effects, such as harm to living uh, resources, hazards to human health, or hindrance to partic you know, particular activities. So these deleterious effects uh, can harm so many different people and stakeholders, not only human beings, but also the other members of the ecosystem. The oldest method of pollution control that has been used is the principle of infinite dilution of wastes. Water is historically one of the substances in which wastes are diluted. Perhaps why it has been associated with the spiritual meaning of holiness and purity. So increased industrialization usually means increased production of waste and potential pollutants. In the ocean, substances including carbon dioxide, cadmium, arsenic, lead and mercury are all disposed of in greater quantities than the natural fluxes can cope with. Under conditions of stress, the species diversity of communities is greatly reduced and the result is the system becomes less stable. A more effective control is to eliminate production of pollution, at least to decrease the level to which natural cycles can cope with. Um, and it's not, if it's not possible, then treatment of pollutants and the consequences is necessary in many cases. Before the substances suitable for recycling or pollution can be treated. So if there are only 100 people in the world, oceans are a good source of dilution, even for a million. But once you get to 7 or 8 million people, oceans are no longer a great source of dilution. Groundwater is not a great source of dilution. Okay. Now some processing of some particular waste can be recycled or organic composting for example. The pollution is, if we go back to the, again to the definition, the appearance of some environmental quality uh, in a quantity which the exposed community cannot process. So it, it saturates the uh, buffers of the environment. Many pollutants threaten water supplies, but the most widespread, especially in underdeveloped countries, is the discharge of the raw sewage into natural waters. This method of sewage disposal is the most common method in underdeveloped countries. It's also prevalent in quasi-developed countries. Sewage, sludge, garbage, and even toxic pollutants are all dumped in the water. Treated sewage forms uh, sludge, okay, which can be placed in landfills, spread out on land, 
it could even be incinerated or dumped in the sea if it's processed properly. But in addition to sewerage, non-point source pollution such as agricultural runoff is a significant source of pollution in some parts of the world, along with urban stormwater runoff and chemical waste dumped by industries. So wastes like municipal sewerage, animal wastes, agriculture fertilizer runoff are all examples. So if we're going to stop the algae blooms that we saw, you need to remove the nutrients before you uh, release them to the environment. Okay. So in 1970, the animal population in the USA was estimated to be 564 million head, uh, which produces a waste equal to about 2 billion people. The animals in intensive animal production facilities are also associated with high energy use. Water tends to be the ultimate sump for waste, and we are dependent upon the natural ability of ecosystems to cleanse waste and produce clean water. It's ironic that the economic benefits of natural actions are usually of no value in economic equations. So the economists really need to revise their calculations. So some people wonder why the United States has such a large global environmental footprint. The, the population is under 400 million people, but the actual pollution is greater than 2 billion because of all the animals. Now some of that agricultural meat production is exported, uh, but some is of course wastes, more than half is wasted. Eutrophication uh, occurs in waters that have enriched nutrient content, which su and this supports excessive algal photosynthesis, as we saw. Increased algal growth results in oxygen-depleted water, which is detrimental to the health of fish. Increased temperature due to climate change and wastewater from industry or cooling water from energy power plants lowers the oxygen concentration of water, which makes the ecosystem more susceptible to stress. And uh, just a point on the uh, Coolidge Dam, which we saw. Um, although there's a capacity for generating electricity, for the last 10 years, it's not been used for electrical supply. In fact, electricity is brought into the power station to maintain the electricity. There are always two people working in the, uh, on the dam site, down in the bottom of the dam, uh, running the water system for the irrigation management. Um, it's sort of ironic. It's a waste of energy. So somebody's calculation on the cost of energy to maintain and repair the turbines. Uh, it, you know, when you have a good water flow, it's sort of a waste of energy. Uh, that's the opinion of some of the people working there. So what's the effects of pollution? Um, some of the effects can be immediate. You can see, for example, the sudden death of a large number of fish. But you can also see prolonged impacts such as defective development or uh, reproductive abnormalities. PCBs, uh, polychlorinated biphenols, were widely used in many industries before their toxicity was understood particularly they were used as insulators in electricity systems. The level of PCBs in some marine animals exceeds the health standards set by some national authorities. But there's no known cases of human sickness from the consumption of animals and fish with these substances. Maybe seals have suffered reproductive damage from the level of PCBs. And you can still find PCBs, even though they've been banned from production for several decades, because they're very long-lasting. Uh, in the Great Lakes in the United States, uh, you do not dredge the bottom sludge because there's so much PCB and other pollutants down the bottom. But there has been a layer of sediment built on top, so it's sort of insulation. Uh, at, at present, another issue is the contamination of groundwater by arsenic. It's an important issue. Countries where arsenic contamination of groundwater has been so far reported are listed. Poland, Hungary, Spain, Sweden, Finland, UK, Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Switzerland, Taiwan, 
Sri Lanka, China, Bangladesh, India, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, Nepal, Iran, Vietnam, Japan, Philippines, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, USA, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Egypt, and Ghana. And the reason some other countries are not listed is people have just not done the studies. So arsenic is a metalloid in group 5A of the periodic table of elements. Besides being used to harden bronze in the Middle Ages, in the Middle East, sorry, about 3,000 years ago, it was a dye in the, used by the Egyptians, Greeks and Romans. It was a potential poison to kill enemies, at least in the days of the Roman Empire, as we can see in the written records. Arsenic compounds are also used in pesticides uh, from around the 15th century. Paris Green, the popular trade name of the copper arsenic complex, was classified by the World Health Organization as a highly hazardous pesticide of class 1B. Arsenic was first detected in groundwater in Argentina in 1917, although the first skin lesions and cancer linked to arsenic explosions were reported in 1955, again from Argentina. The presence of a metalloid in groundwater was next detected in New Zealand in 1939, then in Chile and Mexico in the 1950s and 60s, in Canada and the USA in the 1970s, in several European countries in the 1990s, and then uh, in Asia, you can first see in Taiwan in 1961, and finding at many other countries. But in all the Asian countries, the arsenic contamination originates from natural sources. So it's natural. Of the affected countries in Asia, arsenic contamination has assumed menacing proportions in the Bengal Basin of India and Bangladesh. Uh, also in the Ganga Magna. Brahmaputra Basin as well, these are river basins. More than 50 million people are at risk. So 50 out of 64 districts of Bangladesh and 9 out of 18 districts in West Bengal, India have groundwater arsenic levels higher than the Indian and Bangladesh national standards. One of the earliest symptoms of arsenic poisoning is diffuse uh, melanomas, which is a darkening of the skin, either through the body or in the palms of the hand. Okay, so if you notice that you have, you know, dark palms suddenly uh, from the water, it may well be arsenic poisoning. You need, of course, to get uh, proper testing. Now, the risk of suffering from cancer is estimated to be around. 13 per 1,000 individuals who were consuming one litre of water per day with 50 micrograms per litre of arsenic. So there's many ethical issues associated with arsenic contamination. Um, there's a decision to access groundwater as a drinking water source in spite of the fact that this region experiences heavy rainfall and is ample surface water resources. So, don't take it from the groundwater. It's one of the messages and solutions if you have enough rainwater and surface water. The impact of arsenic poisoning in this area also brings to fore the ethical questions concerning public health ethics, principles such as social utility, respect for human dignity, social justice, and efficiency. So, we have to consider these various ethical issues. When we look at this, and when we're making water wells, just be very careful at how deep your water well is. If it goes to the rocks containing arsenic as a source of groundwater, this is not a good idea. But you may be able to use a different uh, depth uh, to the wells. So the next section in this report, 3.3, looks at water governance. There's some general principles outlined in the section uh, of water governments. Um, so some of these are instruments and issues. Uh, how do we manage water resources? So there could be command and control laws, directives, standards, norms and codes. 
There could be economic instruments such as taxes, levies and subsidies. A consensual approach, hearings, consensus conferences, stakeholder participation. And how do we, what are the ethics, morals and attitudes? Well, we've discussed some of the ethics uh, previously in this report. Now there is a, a section in this in particular about the trans-jurisdictional water quality issues in China. And one of the issues in China, as shown in the figure, is the so many levels of administration. You have 1.6 billion people in your country, you will have multiple layers of, of administration. Central government, provincial government, municipal, county, township, village. Okay. So different water uh, management boards and water resource boards are uh, implemented under the laws. There's also a small entry on water ethics reflections in eucalyptus planting. Now eucalyptus uh, has been widely planted as a fast-growing hardwood tree. It of course comes from Australia. And the, one of the challenges for eucalyptus is that where you have high water scarcity, the high water intake of eucalyptus destroys the natural processes that replenish soil moisture and discharge the sources of underground water, turning the region into completely arid zones. Similarly, eucalyptus damages the innate aleomorphic capacity of other plants, seriously depleting the gene pool. The process initiated by large-scale cultivation of eucalyptus in water scarce areas eventually leads to desertification. On, secondly, on fertile agricultural land, eucalyptus, when planted in short rotation, heavily diminishes soil nutrients, destroying the soil's capacity for biological productivity. Moreover, eucalyptus destroys the environment for soil fauna that are at once factories for reproducing soil fertility and efficient machines for maintaining soil structure. So in the 1960s, eucalyptus emerged as an option for reforestation uh, because it's a fast-growing species. Um, but where there's alternative trees available, it's probably better, if you, unless you're in Australia, where that's a natural environment for eucalyptus, you're probably better to cut it down, harvest the wood, and plant other species. So this is one of the great things of this uh, environment that I appreciate so much is the natural oak and juniper. These are natural species, naturally sown uh, by the birds, the seeds, and uh, the seedlings around the trees. So this is a uh, um, uh, suiting to this environment. This is what has been evolved in this environment. Section 3.4 is access rights to water and practice on page 31. In 1977, the UN Water Conference in Mar del Plata, Argentina, proclaimed that all peoples have the right to access drinking water in quantities and equality equal to their basic needs. And in 1980, uh, the, uh, they declared 1981 to 1990 as the International Drinking Water and Sanitation Decade. UN Resolution 35-18. Now this was an anthropocentric approach to ethics, but still uh, water was uh, critical. Now we've had subsequent decades, of course, of the UN to emphasize biodiversity and the broader approaches. So, besides a dilemma on how to balance conflicting uses of water, which is an issue in international shared water. The domestic regulation of competing uses of water is another important issue. Annually, increasing demand of concurrent uses of water for domestic, municipal, agricultural, industrial, recreational, and environmental purposes are highly competitive by nature and contrary by character. And who can decide this? And there's growing uh, disputes inside countries. So we're going to look at some of those uh, disputes uh, shortly.
So who has the right to control the water? This is uh, really uh, one of these questions on the uh, consideration of uh, access to water. Now, if you're in the same jurisdiction, uh, the laws could become, could become simple. It just then becomes a matter of each individual balancing with a community and then trying to decide. Okay, how much water can you take the groundwater so that you don't affect these trees? Okay. So that's one of the things and there can be environmental management reports as an essential aspect of that. Annually the increasing demand of uh, uh, all these uses um, can lead to disputes. Now you can install meters on the piped water, uh, but it's a bit difficult on the groundwater. In many developing countries, the extraction of groundwater uh, as if it's just part of the land that people have. Okay, and any landowner can extract groundwater inside his or her plot without permits or hindrances for domestic use. Okay, irrigation or selling the drinking water can be done even from your water. So you can extract if you have a strong pump and then of course the water is coming from uh, to replenish your groundwater comes from other people's groundwater. Now we looked at the different ethical principles uh, earlier in the report, chapter 2. So these included the principle of equ equity and availability and applicability of water, page 18. Uh, page 20, the principle of vicinity, the principle of frugality, the principle of transaction, the principle of multiple and beneficial use of water, the principle of mandatory application of quantity and quality measures, 2.11, its principle of compensation and user pays. So let's look at this on page 22. As users of nature, we must compensate nature. If we use other regions' resources, we need to compensate the people whose living standards have been degraded because the resource is being transferred away from them. But how to compensate nature is a very philosophical question. So we can hear the birds singing in the trees, they rely on the trees. If I uh, take over water and the trees die, who compensates the birds, the insects, the flowers, the trees? User pays is an important principle in modern water ethics. When the water is shifted from a common property to, or good to a privatized resource. As users of nature, humans should pay a royalty or fee for using a natural resource on the grounds that it's a limited resource and belongs to nobody in particular, but to the public, the state, international community and so on, as appropriate. If someone is using another locality's resource, compensation must be paid to the people there. For the purpose of sustainable and rational utilization of scarce water resources, and to encourage environmental friendly attitudes, relevant authorities must conduct incentive measures, including appropriate water pricing policy. While setting the price, operational costs for water service and resource costs may be, both be recovered uh, in the water, European Water Directives, for example, it was decided not to support full cost recovery. Amongst the factors behind, it, behind that decision is the undermining of a human right to water. In the meantime, the water pricing policy should ensure equitable and affordable access to safe drinking water is basic human right. 2.12, the principle of polluter pays. The application of this principle has been gradually, gradually extended from its initial purpose to mitigate environmental damages as a preventative tool. Um, it is done by making the polluter pay. So you also pay for the costs of the pollution prevention as well. From a cost-benefit analysis, Expenses that water polluters service operators must pay to mitigate the pollution are often greater than the benefits that derive from polluting activity. 
Therefore, the polluter pays principle is a preventative tool, encouraging investment in facilities and measures that prevent, control and monitor pollution. 2.13 Principle of Participation Public participation in water resources management is also important so that the interests of all groups, especially the poor and underrepresented groups, can be fully represented. For education, open publication of water data, community hearings and internet fora and discussions, individuals and groups can be involved in water using and managing processes and present their needs and concerns. 2.14 The principle of equitable and reasonable utilisation. This customary principle of public international law on shared waters is based on a doctrine of limited territorial sovereignty, recognising the community of interest of riparian states in a navigable water river, and it becomes the basis of a common legal right, the essential features of which are the perfect equality of all riparian states in the use of the whole course of the water, and the exclusion of any preferential privilege of any one riparian state to relation to the others. So this principle was recognised and endorsed in two major normative documents in shared waters. The UNECE uh, Convention on the Protection of Use of Transboundary Water Courses in International Lakes, it's called the Water Convention 1992, and UN Convention on Law of the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses in 1997. To make this principle practicable though, equitable and reasonable utilisation, you need to have some principle of quantified allocation. That is, there needs to be an amount of, to measure and how much you need. To calculate the total amount of water needed in a region for domestic, agricultural, industrial and commercial uses is both an ethical and scientific issue. The Yellow River Committee is a typical Chinese government department that does this every year, namely the allocation of the Yellow River water for the provinces along it. We're looking beyond the boundary of a country and viewing things globally how to allocate water along countries with water shortages. It would be the burden of the UN. And how to articulate principles regarding groundwater allocation is politically difficult. 2.15. Future reflections on water ethics. There is a growing number of studies on applied water ethics and more can be developed. This report is intended to stimulate these debates and is a number of discussions that could be developed. Edward Spence brought forward a medico-ethical art framework. One medico-ethical framework to apply to the analysis of water ethics is based on the ethical theory of the American philosopher Alan Gerwitz. Gerwitz's ethical theory based on the supreme principle of morality, the principle of generic consistency, shows that by virtue of being purposeful agents in sufficient condition, we have prima facie universal rights to freedom and well-being. Those rights being universal must be respected by everyone. Because of their universality, those rights are global. Moreover, those rights can be extended to include animals and natural environment generally, and in a word, the whole ecosphere. So given how essential and indispensable water is to the basic well-being of everyone on the earth, humans, animals and natural environment generally, it follows that access and use of water itself is a basic universal moral right. The distribution of water among its users is therefore an important and crucial universal ethical issue. The definition of moral agents is important for many theories of ethics. We can see an expanding moral community from human beings, anthropocentric, to sentient animals, sentient centric, to living organisms, biocentric, to environment ecocentric. These entities may have their intrinsic rights respected. So actually, Odo Leopold's 1949 land ethic had already expressed this concept to extend the concept of community to include not only humans but also animals and plants as the inanimate components of the environment uh, as well, such as soil, rocks and water.
Leopold collectively refers to animals, plants, soil, rocks and water as land and states the land has a right to continued existence in a natural state, at least in some places. Given the realities of the global water stress crisis, we need to adapt recessive uh, acceptable frameworks of environmental ethics to water resources management. The expansion of an ethical community from a human dimension to include an ecological dimension increases the difficulty of resolving ethical dilemmas. Because of the aggregation of a water scarcity issue, it will increase the conflict between human and ecological concerns. However, Leopold was a, enough of a realist to appreciate the land ethic was a concept before its time, and he compromised by recommending the ethics be considered along with economics and aesthetics. Now, these are, of course, ethical approaches uh, don't come in the context of nothing. Indigenous peoples have been living and surviving with an ethic of water management and resource management because if you don't manage your water, especially in these harsh climates, you will die. Okay, you cannot live in desert. Now, maybe in a rainforest, if you have a, you can have enough water. Okay. You may need public health measures and protect yourself, but you can manage with the water. Um, but in the water-stressed environment, you need uh, ethical principles. So, this aspect of uh, uh, water ethics is very critical, and we have seen, I think, in these chapters so far, why it is critical. I think I need a drink of water. And I do hope that uh, you will come uh, to visit our campus and the forest, the university, different places here, and see. You can see the ecosystem at work and a model of sustainability. So I'd like to uh, take this um, opportunity to start with chapter 4 on page 33 of the Water Ethics uh, Report. We are in uh, Casa Grande in the Gila River Indian community. Um, the construction of this skyscraper uh, over the last millennium is evidence of a community that was living uh, dependent on the water, the water from the Hilla River, which irrigated uh, this plain in the south of the Phoenix Valley area. We're about uh, 50 miles south of Phoenix. So what's the policy options for construction of a practical water ethics today? 4.1 talks about lifestyle change and motivation. From our above review of the practices in water resource policy and management, we can conclude that neither scientific approaches alone, nor legal regulation or economic incentives are able to fully address and respect an increasing demand among competing uses and users in access to water resources. Therefore, and in the course of a growing preference in water policy regulation and management to the expansion of water infrastructure and supply, water ethics could be well suited both as an end and a means in motivating and managing environmentally friendly behavior and ecological awareness. Also in supporting um, policy making uh, both in terms of a process and in terms of a policy itself. Distribution of water must, all things being equal, be made of on the basis of an equitable division of water resources among all its relevant users. However, conflicts in the division of water resources will inevitably arise amongst competing users. Those conflicts must be resolved within the relevant and particular context of sustainability, based on the basic principle that the rights of those for whom the water is a matter of sustaining life itself primary right are contrasted. For example, 
um, to sustaining a level of profitability for some industries, which is the secondary, right? Um, and how do we balance these two? With no intention to contribute to a meta-ethical discussion, but to seek a ground for practical water ethics and lifestyle change, uh, which we believe is a life long-term project, we need sustained efforts at all levels, from the local community to the global scale. This is a long-term project. Indeed, the anthropocentric view of nature's value, whether the motivation or reason behind, is still instrumental in protection of aquatic ecosystems, because we need to consider basic human rights to live in a healthy environment and to access drinking water. 4.2 Valuing Water A prerequisite for sustainable water resource utilization and management is an objective assessment of the total amount of available uh, quantity and accessible water. The available water here means a water with a certain quality that can be utilized for a certain use and various scientific methods are available for water resource assessment, including field survey, remote sensing, numerical models, etc. The information from the assessment could guide and form the basis to economic values of water and provide data for detailed planning and allocation of water resources, as well as for the transaction of water as a commodity uh, in the market. Furthermore, in the light of growing concern over climate change and its negative impacts on human well-being, the economic value of water and wetland ecosystems has been receiving more understanding and recognition. This provisional service of an ecosystem is well conceptualized in the Millennium Assessment Report. However, we have to admit that the value of water and the uh, aquatic ecosystem is predominantly based on a scientific understanding of the ecosystem and its functions. Due to its essential quality to sustain human life, water in the majority of Asia-Pacific countries uh, and in many parts of the world is something citizens are entitled to as a public or state property. As a public good, water consumption follows principles of non-rivalry and non-excludability in a sense that make more consumption by one person in no way shall reduce the physical amount available for others. Legally everyone and all should enjoy uh, water in common. However, in domestic laws there is no clear prescription regarding the quantitative value of water that could be considered essential for human value and survival. Inste instead, there is uh, a hierarchy among different uses of water, whereas in some countries the living use of water is treated as the highest priority. Article 10 of the UN Water Courses Convention requires that in the event of conflict between uses of an international water course, due regard it should be given to the requirements of vital human needs. A statement of understanding issued by the working group clarified that in determining vital human needs, special attention is to be paid to providing sufficient water to sustain human life, including both drinking water and water required for production of food in order to prevent starvation. From this perspective, considering the residential water supply and the ways in which the water is used, the notion of essentialness is not applicable at all. In 1998, at the UNESCO Conference on World Water Resources at the beginning of the 21st century, some participants from Islamic countries rejected economic models of water which were adopted in 1992 uh, International Conference on Water and the Environment held in uh, Dublin, citing the Quran that characterizes water as a free gift from God. For example, in the Dublin Conference, the fourth guiding principle reads, quote, water has an economic economic value in all its competing due uses and should be recognized as an economic good. Within this principle it is vital to recognize first the basic right of all human beings to have access to clean water and sanitation at an affordable price. Further conferences attempted to resolve this issue discussing Islamic perspectives 
and concluding that the fourth principle was consistent with Islam. However, there is hot discussion, regardless of religion, about the privatization of water and its impact on economic scarcity. Policies need to be developed and institutionalized to take account of the ethics of financing models at all levels of water access. The accounting and audit for water use needs to be transparent and open, and we could suggest people become aware of their water fingerprint in the same way that the term carbon footprint has become popular. Section 4.3 talks about an overlapping kind of water ownership. So it takes the case of the water diversion projects in China, um, where we're talking of uh, channels up to 1,300 kilometers um, uh, south of Beijing to bring water to Beijing. So how can we do this ethically? It's a discussion. Also in modern political theory, how do you satisfy the needs of a whole nation uh, when and local communities. Should everything go to the capital? Should everything go to the uh, big cities and take it away from the countryside? Just as any other kind of natural resources, water is not distributed geographically evenly within the country's border. In some places water, both surface water and groundwater, is in such an abundant state that their inhabitants are constantly being faced with the danger of flood. But on the contrary, there are also places where there are such urgent scarcity of water that people cannot even maintain their daily life. And this is a real situation in contemporary China. Uh, statistics show that the average water possession per person in northern China is just one third that of in southern China. Big northern cities such as Beijing, Taishin, etc. and a large number of northern rural areas are in serious shortage of water. Under the same sky and within the same boundary, such an uneven situation cannot be thought of as normal for a country's balancing development, especially if it's uh, considering the just and equal need for every citizen and equal rights. To divert water from one place to another, we must ethically presume that a country's water is owned by all its citizens. Every one of its citizens has an equal right to water in this country anywhere. This is an ethical justification for water diversion. Consequently, there emerge every kind of water adjustment and diversion projects in China. So if we say that something is owned by a group of people, we should think that it can be divided into equal or unequal parts, as many as the numbers in the group. So how do we divide this? And uh, there is a moral suggestion in the uh, chapter. So let's look at uh, this particular environment here. Um, this is Casa Grande, as I mentioned. Uh, it's clearly uh, an illustration that you could build uh, a very distinct structure. Uh, it relied on the presence of water. Now it's covered to protect it from the elements because it's made of mud and earth. Uh, it, the society was so sophisticated and developed for agricultural production they have markers both of the summer solstice and even the lunar solstice. And uh, we find little of that uh, sophistication in uh, many uh, countries. Um, it was surrounded by a pebble, but this is the, the grand house, a large uh, building. It's uh, four or five stories high. Um, so this is a remarkable. It's an illustration that the water management of the Hiller River uh, from uh, the sites where we saw the Hilla River and the San Carlos Dam uh, through the mountains um, coming to the plains uh, this is the plain of Phoenix and eventually the Hilla River flew into the uh, uh, goes into the Colorado but unfortunately much of the Hilla River we'll see uh, doesn't have much water most of the time now the environment here is a uh, very tough Sagura cactus. The first branch usually comes at the age of 50 years and you can see uh, this one maybe 200 years old. Now you can see the structure people think a cactus or how does it constructed? Well this is the remains of a dead cactus here 
and you can see the inner skeleton is, uh, is wood. Okay. And so inside the wood, the hardwood, it looks it's actually a tree. Yeah. And you can see the remains uh, spread out of where this uh, probably died of old age. They live about three, up to 300 years usually. Uh, it's fallen down. Now some of them are uh, because of when they stay there, but you can see the, the kind of solid structure of a wood here and different types of uh, cactus. Uh, clearly this tree has had uh, seen better days. So the shortage of water clearly impacts uh, the environment around here. And uh, what happened when the water uh, was flow was diminished or in times of drought you would have much less um, and uh, eventually they may die. Now you will find in the tree uh, different parts eaten. Some of the birds uh, make a hole, their nest in the tree and you can see this in this uh, cactus over here. Uh, possibly a woodpecker or another bird is living in the cactus. So this is, a, as I said, Casa Grande, and really a historical remnant of uh, the great uh, importance of water in the desert system. And around here you can see what looks like a very dry environment. Okay. So here, here next to Casa Grande, is the San Carlos Irrigation Project. So here you can see the other end of the dam. One of the ends. So the, from San Carlos the uh, water comes in what was the Hilla River and it's controlled through this uh, federal institution. Uh, now we can look more about them. There is a flag. There is uh, some of the substations there. And we're going to go over to area that's at the south of the Hilla River. It flows north in this instance and so it's just entering the Hilla River Indian community coming from the St. Carlos uh, Indian uh, tribe reservation. St. Carlos Apache. So this is the Hilla River. Well there's a bridge. There's a railway bridge. This is, uh, we're on the road bridge. And we do not see water. What we clearly see, however, is there is an accumulation of trees here. So there's some subterranean water uh, in the environment. And we also see the um, existence of uh, flood banks that are ready for excess water, should that occasion arise. Now, uh, there may be times when the water is coming. Clearly, the absence of water is going to be a major determinant. This is the road. But you can see even in the construction of the electricity uh, power line here, the, they are prepared for water and for a flood if the flood should come down the riverbank. The trees are waiting for water. So we can see this is a management of water. Now further down the road we're going to come to the canal. Well we can see the canal. This is an example of uh, where the water is going. You may think why don't they let it flow in the river? farm use. And you can see uh, this water, the 
can see this uh, irrigation system. Now the desert we were in transformed into fields. So we're making hay for animals, corn. So these are clearly issues of water policy and management and a, a values-based decision. Now I'm not criticizing anybody, but I think this is a, interesting when we reflect on the longer term of how we use water and nature. Uh, it is producing food and maybe that is the value that people would like, but uh, something for us to reflect on. This brings us to section 4.4, ensuring water quality. There is an ethical obligation on water providers to ensure adequate water quality. The obligation to protect water from pollution is shared by all who contribute to pollution. Minimal water residue levels are one method to protect water quality, and the World Health Organization, WHO, has set guidelines based on human health. Although one attitude that is displayed by some jurisdictions when faced with challenging standards is that countries and municipalities can give up on meeting these. Therefore standards need to be based on a solid ethical framework for protection of both the environment and human health, not only on pragmatism. International agreements already include ethical principles to prevent pollution. Trondalen and Mushingi uh, argued that the polluter pays principle, the precautionary principle, the principle of national responsibility for transboundary pollution, and the principle of industrial institutionalized environmental impact assessment are all embedded in international environmental conventions such as the Basel Convention and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. While developing and or applying certain standards for the purpose of human health, sanitation or environmental status, we should note that they are defining the mandatory minimum requirements for constituents of water or indicators of water quality. Therefore, standard is a point of departure and its criteria or measurement should not be limited by the technical knowledge or specifications. Instead, it should be determined and led by quality values. For example, the Directive 2000-60-EC of the European Parliament and of the Council on establishing a framework for community action in the field of water policy set the water quality status as quotation high, good, moderate, poor or bad end of quotation, indicating its essential quality values. So that measurements are secondary to the values that the document wants to protect and preserve. The International Standards Organization has issued a number of international standards related to water quality. 4.5, policies to overcome water scarcity. Water scarcity can be categorized into economic and physical water scarcity. Economic water scarcity is where human, institutional, and financial capital limit the access to water, even though water in nature is available to meet local needs and demands. Although physical scarcity of water is challenging to overcome through conservation and water resource management tools, economic policies can be modified to provide water to those who face scarcity despite the presence of water resources. One of the contributing factors to the provision of water in these areas of the world is the privatization of water, which is a controversial strategy. 4.6 talks about a modeling method and a useful decision support tool. So we can find um, all sorts of models and uh, the decisions made on water. We've seen uh, just previously illustrations of the irrigation programs uh, in Arizona. Uh, you can see here we have a green stops, uh, desert reserves. This is a community park in Sacaton, Arizona. Hilla River Indian community. 
So how do we consider the different management options for water? Why do we say the green line is going to stop at uh, this point here? So this part here is green and over here we don't have the resources to make it all green. Same as we saw in the, in the maize field and the uh, wheat field. So nowadays water resource models are being used to inform decisions about water supplies, ecological restoration and waste water management in complex resource systems. Every single major water resource planning and management activity in the world today, whether focused on flooding problems, reservoir operation, groundwater development, water allocation or aquatic ecosystem enhancement, includes models. Okay, so we have to look at uh, different models, uh, utilizing often computer-based models based on uh, observations of the uh, real trials. Another important aspect of policy is discussed in section 4.7, the role of experts, stakeholders and decision makers. So all of the um, people here, uh, decision makers, stakeholders, experts, take on corresponding responsibilities, and this is discussed in figure 8, whether or not it's a public or private sector uh, discussion. Same is true. We have natural scientists and social scientists, people of different fields. Uh, experts need to take the responsibility to advocate, educate, and propagate ethics and help the decision makers in the public build up uh, models and build up practices. But all stakeholders play an important role in the construction of actual water ethics and the ideal water ethics, especially. social and environmental responsibility. They have to adopt water saving technologies, recycle water resources, follow and respect natural rules and protect the environment the water resources self-consciously. Then we have a better construction of water ethics. We also see this needed by everybody. That's why the lifestyle change is such an important uh, aspect. Section 4.8 looks in particular at education. What are education to reduce wastage? How do we reduce wastage? How do we ensure that we always turn off the tap, um, that we try to minimize the leaks? There's also a teaching plan, an example of a water uh, crisis teaching plan in the high school. So we have to uh, look at this. Uh, it's a good way to teach uh, chemistry and pollution and other aspects even to teach art. We have poems about water, songs about water, and uh, other aspects. Section 4.9 talks about balancing international governance with national sovereignty. So in many countries, water is not just an ethical issue, it's also a political issue. Uh, you have uh, waters that flow through different regions and the more densely uh, related you have uh, different countries' boundaries, you have more international issues. Um, so this fair sharing of water is uh, critical. Now the case studies in Asia Pacific talk about issues such as in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. These are countries with uh, really large water issues, large areas. Um, we've also seen before, we talked about rivers, rivers between the uh, India and Bangladesh. We talked about rivers such as the Mekong, uh, flowing from uh, Yunnan province in China through uh, uh, another six or seven countries. How can we ethically control the overuse of any resource? We can see also the issue of water at the 200 mile maritime limit that many countries in the world have tried to demarcate as a limit on their access to resources, uh, fisheries and um, uh, energy such as 
So, global influences are discussed here in the sense we need a global buyer base. We have natural variations in the season, in the climate. These also cause natural variations in the amount of uh, animals or plants that would be living, for example, fish. Rainfall really varies. We have uh, effects such as El Nino, uh, which causes more rain to fall in California, Arizona, and less rain to fall in certain other parts of the world. So in section five uh, is the conclusions. It's on page 42. Let me read it. The aim of this report is to illustrate how water ethics can make a difference to water-related practices. The purpose is to reveal gaps in existing knowledge to researchers and funders of research, to examine linkages between the research and policy making, and to provide a cross-cultural review of the issue, to educate readers on water ethics and to present policy options to governments at all levels. The major focus of the report has been to study the ethical issues associated with water resource utilization and management, including its uses in energy and other domains in many countries. Water has deep meanings for people, and by exploring this relationship, um, we may not only understand more the relationship between living organisms and people and the environment, for aquaculture, fishing, and agriculture and enjoyment, for example, but we also may understand more about ourselves as human beings. In a global age we live in, the question of the common oceans and the required diplomacy provides very important precedents and lessons for future global planning. It also provides a precedent for protecting biodiversity that is increasingly being recognized. We hope that the report can offer guidance to governments and people in decision making that is necessary for our use of water and our very survival. There is an accepted international norm, an ethical norm, that human beings are entitled to access to water as a human right. Equity in availability and applicability of water is an important ethical issue that has significant policy implications. The development of water ethics is an important supplement to the traditional command and control in economic instruments that are common in modern water resource management. There are several key principles listed in this report that can be applied in different cultures and circumstances. So we looked at the principles of equity, vicinity, frugality, quantification, transaction, users pay, and participation as guidelines for water ethics and construction of an ethical water policy. The world view, view varies from anthropocentric to ecocentric view, view, viewpoints across all countries in the world. And inside every country you find people of anthropocentric and ecocentric views. Aggregation of water scarcity issues will increase the conflicts between humans and the uh, ecological concerns if an ecocentric view is adopted. However, without such a view, humankind will lose even more biodiversity and the environment. There are existing precedents for international water sharing, including with primarily non-human environment systems, and for protection of environmental resources, however they need further development. Conducting objective assessment of water resources and implementing modeling tools will provide a scientific basis for construction of practical water ethics. Experts, stakeholders and decision makers all should play important roles in constructing water ethics. Education should be conducted starting from young people and including professionals in every sphere of decision making. More studies are needed to address existing gaps in our understanding and approaches to governance and ethics of water, to link the extensive large agreements on water sharing, to change consumption patterns within and between countries. The authors also call for future research to better understand the complex foresight studies involving water use in various sectors such as agriculture, energy and industry under the framework of ethics and climate change. Now the rest of the report has uh, case studies which are very, uh, I think, interesting uh, and provide a lot of concrete data. We also at the Ubias Epic Institute have been trying to get
intrinsic to the views of ethics in the non-Western world. Of course, in the traditional Western world, it was also quite uh, critical and central. So let's hope we can work together and uh, discuss various examples and ways to move forward. So uh, let's close looking at some more water. The water is used. Without it, our life would be very dry. Irrigation systems are clearly important. People like, they enjoy water. One day those pipes might be used to bring down that dust. But remember, we've seen where this water is coming from. Okay. The water is coming from um, upstream. There's always an upstream. Yeah. And every country poses that issue of how to balance the issues of uh, water and industrialization. And if we don't uh, take care of our water, we're going to become like a dust. So this, this is an animal farm in Arizona. Now, the feed is coming out of the side and the cows are trying to eat. The cows generally are living in these long sheds with open air and fans. And you can see long rows. There are thousands of them. So in a sense, these are free-range cows, but they're uh, uh, not in pens. But they have the option to come out and eat, put their head through the fence. So this is quite an incredible farming operation, you can see, uh, around here. On the other side, they have long sheds to store the hay. Also, when they're growing lucerne and other crops to feed the animals here. So this is uh, in western Arizona. So in the past, the cattle would roam around in the uh, hot suns, 100 degrees outside. But now they're growing in large stacks in fields. The fields have sheds and a feed. And then the water is in irrigated areas. So this system is, I guess, modern free-range cattle agriculture. And you can see the agriculture in the desert 